Why are summers at the Shalom Hartman Institute so special? Because that's when Jewish leaders and learners, like you and me, travel to Jerusalem to wrestle with big ideas and study with Hartman's inspiring faculty. The Shalom Hartman Institute is a pluralistic think tank and educational center for the Jewish people. Our scholars draw on 3,000 years of Jewish wisdom to develop the ideas we need to face today's challenges. This summer, the pandemic has prevented us from traveling, but it doesn't prevent us from learning together. Welcome. Join hundreds of Jewish leaders for All Together Now, a month-long celebration of ideas from the Shalom Hartman Institute. From now until July the 23rd, come learn with us in this moment of crisis and opportunity. from our New York office. Behind me, you may notice something that looks like an aerial photo. And in fact, it is. It is an aerial photo of people learning in our Jerusalem Mahon, our Jerusalem campus, uh, just to make us all feel like we're there together, even if we can't be there in person. The people who are coming back to learn with us after years of learning with us, after one session of learning with us, welcome back. And the people who are new, we are so, so happy to have you. You'll see, I think, in the chat, if you missed anything at the beginning, you'll see it in the chat. What we want to do this summer with you is we want to talk about Jewish ideas, Torah, for this moment. Now, of course, we know that the corona moment has really given us pause to think about a lot of things, politics, religion, social issues, and plenty of the various political, social, and religious developments during the coronavirus that happened to intersect and actually we find out it's not so happenstance, but there are deep connections between them, have only exacerbated certain tensions and certain questions. And the issue that I want to talk about today is something that predates corona and will post-date corona. And yet I think it's really significant to talk about it in this moment. And that is exactly what we called this session, this shiur on truth and relationships in a polarized era. I wanna talk with you and I wanna think with you about how our relationships, that is people, groups, affiliations that we have that are important to us and have emotional resonance for us, how those affect our sense of truth. And what I mean by that is our moral values, our opinions about things, what we think is right and what we think is real. And not only do I want to examine how our relationships impact what we think is true, I also want to think about how what we think is true and what we believe is right and our opinions and our moral values are impacting our relationships. In this moment of pandemic, I've never had a deeper experience of realizing just how intertwined we all are with each other and how much we depend on each other, how we're going through very similar experiences. And yet it is precisely at this time that we are seeing a real spike in the sense of polarization in our various communities around the world. Certainly as a New Yorker, as an American, I'm feeling this, but it isn't just a phenomenon that's been growing in America, it's a phenomenon that's been growing all over the world. And so let's think about it as three basic questions. The first is, how is it that my affinities to or my alienation from certain people or certain groups shapes what I think? So if a person who I like or who I feel loyal to said it, it's true or it's right or I need to interrogate it less. If a person who I disagree with or have problems with generally or am alienated from says it, it's hard for me to see any truth in it. It's hard for me to even give it a second look. So that's my first question. My second question is what happens when our ideology becomes so important to us that we're only forging relationships 
around ideology. And what that means is that the cycle continues because I only hear certain versions of the truth from the people that I spend time with. And the people that I spend time with reinforce my understanding of the truth. And lastly, what I might call the flip side of the coin, what happens in our relationships that we already have with friends and with family where we deeply disagree? And I want to just make a point. A year ago, if we had spoken about this topic, it would have been about differences between left and right, whether politically or religiously, whether about domestic politics or about politics abroad, about politics in Israel, social issues. But right now, what we're also seeing is not just differences and relationships splitting apart over ideology between people who are generally ideologically opposed to each other, but even within camps of ideology, even within ideological camps, if you say something that the mainstream of your ideological camp doesn't agree with, you're out. And it happens really, really quickly. And so what I see is that this is cannibalizing the ability to actually speak. I want to get your experiences in the room for a minute by asking you to answer a poll that will take you 15 seconds. The poll is basically asking, what is it that is straining your relationships right now? And you can fill out as many as apply. My, my colleague, Mike Groomer, is taking care of the poll. So Mike, if you could put up the poll for people to respond to, that would be great. Which of the following issues are you most worried is or are straining your relationships with family and friends? So if you just take a minute, probably more like 15 seconds, you can get a sense of what we're dealing with here. Okay, we're going to show you the results of the poll. There are over 400 of you here. 38% of you said that Israeli politics are straining your relationship. 57% domestic politics. Social issues, 38%. Religious differences, 13%. Observing COVID-19 restrictions, 57%. If that doesn't give you a sense of just how polarized we are, I don't know what would, and I think it's also worth thinking about whether these differences are with people who you usually share opinions with, or whether these differences are with people who you don't usually share opinions with. Let's talk about why this is dangerous. It's dangerous because it turns everything into a black and white issue, when not everything is a black and white issue. It's dangerous because it pushes people to join teams, instead of actually seeking out what's true. It turns smart discourse into just trading barbs and insults or just rooting for your team. It eats away at our interest in growth. And that for me as an educator is deep. It eats away at our interest in growing and learning new things. And going back to our opening, if in the midst of the pandemic, this is how we're feeling, I'm not really sure how we come back from this. And so if we are looking at a situation that is bad for truth and bad for relationships, it is incumbent upon us to take a step back from all of the advocating that we're doing and all of the typing and the online conversations that we're having and all of the fights that we're getting into and to actually take a step back and think deeply about the question of how truth and relationships should interact and how can they interact. If we have any doubts about what's important about this, let's just say what's at stake. Of course, what's at stake on the ideological side is obvious. It's the reason why we're willing to go to bat for our ideology and push people out of the way and ruin our relationships is because we feel that it's urgent. But I also wanna talk about an urgency on the other side. The urgency on the other side, as political philosopher Martha Nussbaum notes, is that you cannot have a community. You cannot have a country. You cannot have an entity that is corporate 
that is made up of many people with abstract principles alone. There needs to actually be a sense of devotion to each other. There needs to be an ability to sacrifice for one another. And what happens as we get further and further apart is that our ability to see each other as people for whom we would sacrifice, as people with whom we would share a society, gets smaller and smaller and smaller. We don't grow in our own ideas and our own opinions, and we shrink our sense of community. And so today we're going to spend a little time learning some Gemara, as is my want. We're going to look at two different sugyo, two different sections in the Gemara in Ketubot, the tractate Ketubot, where the rabbis are trying to understand what is the relationship, what kind of relationships are judges supposed to have? Or how much should a judge, who is both a truth discerner and a truth teller, how much is a judge meant to be swayed by their relationships? And it will not surprise you to know that in these two sugyot, in these two sections, we actually find opposing approaches to that question. What is the connection between our emotional relationships and our ability to discern and to tell the truth? And so I want to learn these two together, first of all, just to share some of the complexity that is around this question. And second of all, because I don't want this shiur to be the end of the conversation. I want it to be the beginning of the conversation. And there's lots, lots more to talk about. Let's open up to our very first source. And I want to tell you that what I plan to do here is I don't want to leave questions just for the end. I'd like to take questions after each source. These are two sources that we're looking at. And after each source, I would like to take questions. And I've asked my colleague, Justice, who's going to be looking at the questions in the Q&A, to aggregate them. So at some point after I finish teaching the first Gemara, I'm going to say to him, Justice, can you, can you give me a few questions from the chat? We may not get to everybody's, and I apologize for that, but we are trying our best to make this as interactive as possible. And you should know I'm looking at a computer, but I'm thinking of all of your smiling faces um, and, and also your listening faces. Some people don't have smiling faces when they listen. They just have kind of listening faces. So this first slide is essentially what I mentioned from Martha Nussbaum, where she's talking about how you develop patriotism. And she says exactly attachments to good principles and even abstract principle dependence emotions are not sufficient to motivate people to make big sacrifices. It's not enough to be devoted to principles. You have to be devoted to people. For this, we need a type of love an emotion that is not simply abstract and principle dependent, but that conceives of the nation as a particular with a specific history, specific physical features, specific aspiration that inspire devotion. There's the place of emotions in being able to build a healthy community is big, it's deep, and we need to give it its due. Can you do me a favor, Michael, and move to the slide that starts us on our Gemara? automatically, our Gemara in Ketubot 105b, the next slide. Okay, here's how we start. Imagine that what happens at the beginning of this chapter in Ketubot, which is the 13th chapter of Ketubot, is a conversation about Dayanim, about judges. And in this context, the rabbis start to talk about what it is that a judge should be swayed by and what it is that a judge should not be swayed by. And I'm fascinated by the opening. Let's, let's read it together. Ki ata Ravdimi, when Ravdimi came, Amar, he said, Darash Rav Nachman bar Kohen. Rabbi Nachman, the son of Kohen, uh, expounded. Wait a second, wait a second. Rabbi Nachman, the son of Kohen? Yes, Rabbi Nachman, who clearly was a Kohen. That's going to be important. He says, my dichtiv, what is written in the book of Proverbs, chapter 29? In Proverbs, we learn that a king should establish a land through justice, meaning they should govern through justice, but someone who loves gifts is going to overthrow their community, their nation, meaning it's destructive if you're too interested in gifts. 
and look at what this man from a priestly family, remember the priestly families who subsisted mm -hmm. on the food, on the truma, on the contributions that average Jews gave them. This man from a priestly blessing, from a priestly family, excuse me, takes the word trumot and makes it not about gifts, but about truma, about the actual contribution, the grain contribution that kohanim, that priests would get. So what does it mean that a king is going to uphold the land through mishpat, through justice, but somebody who loves gifts will destroy it? Im domed dayan lamelech, if the dayan, if the judge is like a king, she'eno tzarich leklum, who doesn't need anything, meaning financially doesn't need anything, is financially independent. Now, parentheses, we know that a king does need things financially. That's why they tax people and they take things. But it's different. The dependency is a dependency of their choice. It's about their rule rather than need. If a dayan, if a judge is like a melech, is like a king who doesn't need anything, ya'amid aretz, then they're going to be able to uphold the land. Ve'im domel kohen, And if instead the judge is like a kohen, and what's so problematic about a kohen? Shemechazer al hagranot, who actually goes around the granaries to collect food from people, truma from people, yarsena, they're going to destroy it. And this is a wild way to begin. This is Rav Nachman, who's from a priestly family, says, I want you to know, in order to be a judge, you can't be a priest. In order to be a judge, you have to be somebody who doesn't feel that they owe their litigants something. They don't feel that they're dependent on their litigants. Rabba bar Rav Shila goes one step further. I'm a Rabba bar Rav Shila. Hi, Dayana. That Dayan, that judge, the Shal Sheilta, who borrows things from people and really needs to borrow things because they don't have things. Pasol Lemei Dandina. They are not permitted, and that's very strong language. They are invalid from actually being able to adjudicate cases. Velo Amran, but you know, you should just know, Velo Amran, Ella de Leitle Le that's only if they don't have something that they could lend to others. If they do have something to lend to others, which means they're not totally dependent on other people, but other people are also dependent on them, then it's okay. And then the Gemara says, Eni, is that true? Baha Rava, what about Rava? Sha'il she'ilta mi debei bar Marion. He used to borrow things from the house of bar Marion. Even though they never borrowed anything from him. And Rava was a judge. And pay attention to that because he's going to feature very prominently in this whole conversation. Rava was a judge. How could he do that? How could he judge those people if he's financially dependent on them? So the answer is actually he was trying to give them a sense of significance by borrowing. It's not that he needed them. It's that he wanted to make them feel good. Now we know that in and of itself tells you something about their relationship that I wonder what happens when they come into the courtroom as a litigant. But suffice it to say, this opening paragraph, I think what it gives us is it gives us a sense that if you have a quid pro quo kind of relationship with someone, if you have a reason to feel that you owe them because they did something good for you personally, and by the way, I'm gonna add my own color commentary from today, because they do something good for your community, because they did something good for you politically, because they did something good regarding what you hope to see in Israel, whatever it is. That is a moment, says the Gemara, that actually could be highly problematic in terms of your ability to do mishpat, in terms of your ability to rule through justice. Now you might say to me, but I'm not a, I'm not a judge. Why do I need... What I'd like to do is I just want to use this as a prototype for looking out at how even subconsciously and sometimes consciously, the sense that I owe someone actually impacts what I'm able to say to them and what I'm able to hear about them. We know this on a micro level in our Jewish communities and we know this on a macro level in our societies. So the quid pro quo is very significant. This is not yet only about emotional relationships. It's even the emotions that grow as a result of getting something. 
And because we're not in the room together, I just want to bring you into something. My sister got married a few weeks ago, Mazel Tov. My sister got married a few weeks ago and we made a video asking, what is it that you love about Aunt Ariel? I asked my kids. And my younger one, he couldn't think of anything, which is wild because he loves her to pieces. Finally, he said, oh, I know, she gives me cookies. Now, he doesn't, it, the fact that people give something to us, it makes us predisposed to them in a certain way. Or if people take something from us, it makes us predisposed to them in a different way. And we should be aware of that. Let's go to the next slide. The Gemara continues, and don't worry, I will take Q&A and even comments um, after we finish this section in Ketubot Kuf He Amabet. Uh, 105b. The Gemara continues by moving away from just the idea of someone who gives you something or being dependent on them to that question of just emotional closeness. And very surprisingly, actually indicates that the idea of shochad, of bribery in the Torah, is not about primarily a person giving you a 20 or slipping you a hundred dollar bill to do right by them in the courtroom. It's actually primarily about creating an affinity, which honestly, when we think about bribery, I, I think if I were a judge and somebody gave me money, I, I would actually feel pretty gross about that. But that's not the way this Gemara is reading it. Alma Rava, Rava says, we're on the slide. My time of the Shochdam, what is the reason? And what a, a strange question. What is the reason for not being allowed to accept bribes under Jewish law? Because as soon as you receive the bribe, you, your mind becomes close. And mind really means your whole self, your emotion. You become close. The way you think becomes closer to that person who gave you the bribe. And that person becomes as though they're like you. And nobody sees their own problems and flaws and faults. Now we all know, of course, we all see our faults and our, our, our faults and our flaws. In fact, we sometimes see our own flaws and our own faults, even when they're not there. And yet this Gemara is saying something about a blind spot. There is a blind spot that develops when a person has a sense of closeness to someone. And that is a concern for Rava. Remember, the same Rava who is the judge who borrows and, and, and doesn't lend, same person, and he's going to show up throughout. In fact, the Gemara says, my shochad, what is shochad? What is bribery? It's a play on words, shohuchad, that they become one, right? There aren't too many places in the Gemara where we actually take a mitzvah from the Torah and try to give it a play on words in order to explain what the issue is. But they're really trying to get to the heart of it. It's not about the money. It's not about the quid pro quo. It's actually about feeling close. Amma Rav Papa. Rav Papa says, and don't forget about Rav Papa because he's also going to feature prominently. Amma Rav Papa, lo lidon inish dina. I want you to know, I don't think that a person should be adjudicating leman derachimle, someone who they love or have a, a good relationship with, but lo leman desanile. And, and they shouldn't be adjudicating someone in their court who they hate. Because derachimle, the person who they love, lo chazi chova, they're not going to be able to see their faults. Desanile, the one they love, lo chazi zechuta, they're not going to be able to see their merits. Now, again, you don't need to be a judge to experience this, right? You don't need to be a judge to experience this phenomenon. And I want to just point out that Rava and Rav Papa seem to be saying similar things, but it's not totally clear that they really are. Because remember, Rava does not tell us that it's somebody who is their friend and therefore they feel close to them. Rava says, what's the problem with someone giving you a bribe? Because once they give you something, you'll feel close to them. Whereas Rav Papa arguably goes a step further his step further is, wait, 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 you, forget bribery. It doesn't have to be about bribes. It's simply about your relationship, right? He says, leave anything that sniffs of a quid pro quo out, out the door. Just think about what it means 
to adjudicate somebody who you love, someone who you care about, right, in your courtroom. Now, I have to say, interestingly enough, the question of whether somebody can be a witness for somebody else, if they're their close friend or if they're their enemy, also comes up in the Gemara. And it doesn't actually end up being as black and white as this. This is incredibly black and white. Your ability to really discern something that isn't mostly about having that relationship or isn't colored completely by that relationship is really difficult in a way that actually the poskim, the halachic decisors, the legal decisors decide that actually it's okay if you have a relationship with somebody, not a family tie, but if you have a friendship with somebody, or if you have an enemy ship with somebody, or more likely a frenemy ship, as we often see in life, that you are still allowed to be a witness for them or against them. Why is that? And some of the early medieval commentators suggest that the distinction is the following. If you are a judge, you are going through a process of discernment. Whereas if you are a witness, you are trying to tell people what the facts are. Now, we know that the facts can be found out much more easily, even though we also know how difficult that can be right now, but the facts can be found out much more easily than the idea of actually taking in everything that you've heard as a judge and trying to decide what you think about that. So the rabbis have a recognition that this is an arena where actually so much of the subjective really comes into the conversation. One more piece, and then we're going to take Q&A, because this, and, and if you think this Gemara is long, the reason why I wrote on the top, Babylonian Talmud, to vote 105b to 106a, is because I didn't even give you the 106a, and I hope everybody goes to their Talmud and looks at the continuation of this conversation, because the continuation of this conversation just gets richer and richer and richer. Let's go to the next slide, Michael. Now we're going to see Rava yet again in conversation with somebody, but not in conversation with Rav Papa this time. It's going to be in conversation with Abaye, his usual interlocutor. Whether they ever actually met is a question, but they certainly talk to each other's ideas. Amar Abaye. Abaye says, Hi, Tsurvamira Banon. This young scholar, Demarachaminle, who people like, meaning newly minted leadership, who people like, B'nai Mata, their city members like, love Mishum de Maletve. It's not because they're so great, right? It's not because they're better. Ela Mishum de Lo Mochach Luhu B'mile Dishmaya. The reason they like the new young leader is because that new young leader doesn't give them rebuke, doesn't give them tocha that new young leader tells them what they want to hear. And you kind of get the sense that this could be a conversation from somebody who's a more established leader, like Abaye, who says, look at these young leaders. Everyone's so excited about them. They're so charismatic because they don't yet have the gravitas to tell people what they're doing wrong. This is the flip side of the coin. How do you think about yourself when you are trying to discern? when you are trying to understand what's real and what's true and what's right, how often is that qualified by what people are going to think of you? I'm actually worried to express this opinion because people are going to jump down my throat, because they're going to think less of me, because they're... That is a very sticky part of our discourse right now. And those people could be the people who are usually on your team. But you say the wrong thing, you say the thing they don't want to hear, you challenge them, and that's a real strain on the relationship. Amma Rava, Rava says, You know, at the beginning, I thought that everyone in Mahoza, my town, I thought they all loved me. And that was before I was a judge. When I became a judge, Amina, I said to myself, you know what, I guess, some of them don't like me, and some of them probably really like me, because 
you know, presumably some of them I've adjudicated, you know, they sat in my court as litigants and I sent some of them home with money and some of them home empty handed. And the people who I said innocent like me or take this money and go home like me and the people who I said guilty or I'm sorry you don't get anything probably don't like me. But then he says something crucial. When I saw that a person who may come to my court now and I may say that they're guilty or I may obligate them to pay something, tomorrow or another time when they come in my court, they win their case. Amina, I said to myself, if they like me, everybody likes me because at some point I've probably helped them in, 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 their, in the court. But and if they hate me, then they all hate me because I probably told them they're guilty or obligated them in something. In other words, what Rava basically says is he says, you can't be overly concerned with what people think about you. What you need to be overly concerned with is your integrity. What does it mean to be a person who today can accept what somebody is saying and tomorrow from that same person could say, I'm sorry, I challenge what you're saying. What does it mean to be a person who can challenge what some, an interlocutor says and some other time can say, you know what? I think you're right. I think you have something to say. That is really difficult. And I need no other proof than when I look on Facebook and somebody actually agrees with someone on the other side. And there has to be this whole qualification that says, I usually disagree with everything this person says, but here I think she makes a good point. That qualification, it, it, it speaks to an anxiety that either people are going to think that you're on the wrong team and that you've sold out, or that people are gonna mistake your ability to see nuance and see something right with your ability to see something, not to see anything at all. They're gonna think that, your abil that it's all or nothing, your ability to see nuance and to say, here it's right, here they're right, actually means that you've given up on everything else that you think and you're permanently on their side. And so there, there's, no, there's no reading of nuance, there's no reading of integrity. We can take down the slide, Michael. This Gemara, the three parts of it that I've shared with you so far, this Gemara really speaks to how our relationships impact our truth. That sometimes we do not think about what's real and what's true because of who said it. We reject it out of hand or we accept it wholeheartedly. It speaks to the fact that we worry about the ability to maintain relationship when we say something that others may perceive as wrong. And Rava essentially says, if you want to be a judge, if you want to be someone who discerns truth, your focus cannot be on who's going to like me and who's going to dislike me. Your focus actually has to be on whether you're showing the integrity that it's not about a team but it's actually about understanding the issues. I'm gonna pause here for questions and comments. Justice, if you wanna come onto the screen and give us a few, I think that would be super helpful. Great. Uh, thanks, Elena. Hi, everyone. My name is Justice Baird. I'm the Senior Vice President at the Shalom Hartman Institute, and I'll just be giving Alana some of your questions. So Alana, the Q&A uh, function has been uh, pretty live as you've been doing this first section of Gemara. And uh, so here's a few questions uh, for you to kind of reflect on. Uh, the first one, there's a, there's a set of questions around how relationships affect our judgment and the dynamics of that, and some questions about, like, neutrality isn't even possible, that there's always imbalance in a relationship. So how does, how does that uh, function? And, and not only relationships, but, but the perspectives of people of even the same events are, are different and that is affecting their judgment as well. So that whole, one set of questions there. Um, a second set of questions uh, that I, one from Rabbi Howie Goldsmith that I think is interesting, who says that Jewish life, Jewish communal life, congregations, um, organizations are all built on relationships. Like that's 
how they function. So what, what does this piece of Gemara have to say about the entire structure of Jewish life if it's saying that we can't judge uh, morally uh, along the way uh, through that? Um, one more question about judges, about the fact that if, they, if judges don't need anything from anyone, can they really be in touch with the needs of other people, right? And then the last, uh, this is more of a comment, uh, there's a few Canadians out there today and they wanted us to know that it is Canada Day today. And specifically, uh, happy Canada Day. Uh, I'm they wanted Canadian. to say that, 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 that the comments were about how the poll that, that we started with, um, or the results of it anyway, may show a little bit of an American bias and, and how we think of them. So those are a few questions for you to start with. Oh my gosh, those are such great questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So let's talk about the impossibility of neutrality, perspectives on the same event, there's always imbalance. Let's talk about that for a minute. So I actually wanna quote another idea of Martha Nussbaum's, which is she talks about how from our very earliest relationships, all relationships have um, this, what she called subversive combination of love and resentment from the time that I'm a baby and someone's gonna feed me. Love, because we know how important that person is in our lives and how we need them. There's a need, it's an emotional need as a baby, there's a physical need, there's their needs. And at the same time, there is resentment because you can't control what that person is gonna do or what those people are gonna do. And so I actually think that by focusing on the fact that there is no such thing as neutrality and not being so surprised every time in a relationship we find out that someone thinks differently than we do, that there is something to be said for just realizing that that's a feature and that's not a bug. That's actually a feature of any relationship. It's the same as the person who you love not you know, closing the toothpaste tube. The stakes aren't so high there, depending, but it's the same idea. We don't control what other people think. And more than that, another part, another feature is that people see things differently. As you said, the very same event they see differently. What I want to be able to do is I want people to be conscious of that. I want people to be aware of that. And I want us to be conscious of what's making us see a particular event in a certain way and what's making us understand an idea or an opinion in a certain way instead of just being knee-jerk about it. So that's one. On the question of Jewish communal relationships, I actually think this is a big one. I'm actually doing a continuing elective for rabbis at some point this summer where we can talk about leadership and these, these questions. Because in Jewish community, it isn't just that we, it's built off of our relationships with each other. It's also built off of relationships between leaders and constituents. And leaders have different valences. You've got your religious leaders, you've got your political leaders, you've got your philanthropic leaders, you've got your social leaders, and you've got different kinds of constituents. And I actually do think that I don't want this Gemara to be dismissed out of hand one way to dismiss this Gemara is say, well, you know what? We're not all judges. We have some people are going to be in the role of judge and we want to keep them, you know, in that, in that narrow place where they have to be careful about their relationships. And other people are just going to, you know, you have, to, you have to get embedded in those relationships and allow them to wash over you. Well, I think it's important to get embedded in those relationships and allow them to wash over you. I do think that self-reflection in any community, and in the Jewish community, self-reflection on when are we developing certain ideas as a quid pro quo, or we're developing certain ideas because we have a love of that person or that entity or whatever it is, and when are we developing ideas because we've actually talked them out, because we've actually thought them through, because we've actually interrogated them. I think those are, those are deep questions. I, I want this Gemara to be a challenge to that and not something that's dismissed um, because of that. The poll, yes, of course, the poll. Look, all I can tell you is that I'm sitting here in the United States of America, and if I don't talk about this with anybody on this, I think I'm gonna implode 
and a lot of us sitting at home are, are going to implode. So if our Canadian friends are basically looking and saying, tough luck, Americans, I will say, we need your sanity. We need you as an example for us of how to just calm things down. And I also think that the very underpinnings of our, of the American, of American society, essentially, and Canadian society are so different. And one of the questions we can ask ourselves is what are the features of American life that actually feed into this polarization in a different way than Canadian life would feed into it, right? So it's not just a question of what do we do once we're in a system, it's asking a question about systems. And the last thing I'll say is that, isn't it problematic for a judge not to have relationships? It absolutely is problematic. And that is what's so sticky. That is exactly the segue to our second Gemara. Because our second, if our first Gemara that we looked at is warning us about the possibility of blind spots and being blindsided, our second Gemara is going to warn us of the dangers of not leveraging our relationships in our search for truth. So Michael, can you bring us to the slide that says Babylonian Talmud Kitubot 85a? Not the one with the questions, the one with the text. Thanks. Okay. So remember, in our earlier Gemara, it was Rava, it was Rav Papa, and we also had a Baye. So we're not going to have a Baye in this Gemara, but we are going to have Rava and Rav Papa. And let's just remind ourselves so that we can keep it incredibly clear in our minds as we look at this Gemara. Let's just remind ourselves that one of the things that Rava told us is basically make sure that you're not telling the same people that they're always right. Make sure that you're not telling the same people that they're always wrong. Make sure it's about the issues and the case, and it's not about the people themselves. He also told us that he was worried about bribery because it makes you too close to the person who gave something to you, either because you feel like you owe them or because they've gotten into your good graces in one way or another. What we saw from Rav Papa, oh, excuse me, and then Rava also, it, it, sorry, what we saw from Rav Papa is, well, actually, we should be very careful about judging people who we're related to, not through family ties per se, but through our deep emotional connection of either animosity or love. Well, we'll see what happens in this Gemara, which actually just comes 20 pages earlier. Hahi itata. There was a woman, Deichaiva Shvua, who was required to give an oath, Beidina de Rabba, in the courthouse of Rabba. Great, we're back with Rabba. Now, what does it mean that a person is supposed to give an oath in court, a litigant? It could mean one of two things. They could be giving an oath not to have to pay something that someone else said they owe, or they could be giving an oath to be able to collect their money, okay? Now, you should know that Rashi interprets this Gemara as this woman was supposed to take an oath that she would not have to pay anything, okay? Amrale bat Rav Rav Chista's daughter said to Rava, Yadanaba, you know, I know that woman. I know that she's the Chashuda Ashvua, that she is suspected of giving oaths. In other words, I know that woman. She's not supposed to give an oath. She's a liar. Now, who's the daughter of Rav Chista? The daughter of Rav Chista is Rava's wife. Rava's wife is telling him that in his courtroom, he is going to have to change what he has decided. He literally told the litigants in his court, you are going to have to, she told the litigant, you're going to have to take an oath. And his wife said that woman can't take an oath because she's a liar. Why didn't Rava know that that woman was a liar. 
Well, presumably, Rava's wife in that time would have more relationships with women. And perhaps, and I like to think of sort of the social places where women would gather, maybe they were at the wash basin and Rava's wife heard something about this woman or got to know this woman and knows something more than Rava knows. So the first thing is this Gemara starts by telling us what Rava's spousal relationship affords him in terms of knowing about someone in his court. The second thing is what Rava's wife's relationship, what her proximity, the people to whom she is proximate, what information that has given her. But wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. I'm not so comfortable with that. We said that our relationships as somebody just pointed out, I think it was um, Howie, that our relationships, the Jewish community is built off of relationships. And that other Gemara said to us, hey, be careful because that's gonna bias you. Should Rava really be listening to his wife's insider trading outside of the courtroom? This is not an example of somebody who came to the court and gave actual testimony. It's not following any of the standards right? There are objective standards in Jewish law. Someone would have to come and, and testify in court that this woman is not believable. She can't take an oath. We completely circumvented the whole system. And yet, Rava listens to her. We're on the third line. Afa Rava Lishvua, Asha Pinegda. Rava actually went back to his court presumably the next day, and told the other litigant to take the oath instead. The impact of that is that the woman who was supposed to not have to pay anything, she's now going to have to pay because the other litigant swears that she's owed. The entire verdict of this changed as a result of Rava having a relationship with the daughter of Rav Chista, and as a result of the daughter of Rav Chista, having a relationship with Rava's wife. Zimnin, another time, Habu Yatve Kame Rav Papa Virav Adabar Madne. Another time, there were other litigants in front of him, or perhaps just colleagues coming to watch. Rav Papa and Rav Adabar Madne. Aitu Ahush Daragabe, they brought a particular document, a contract, before Rava, and Amrle Rav Papa and Rav Papa said, Yadanabe, I know, just like Rava's wife said, I know, I know, Dishtara Priyahu, I know that this is a contract that's already been paid. If someone's bringing this contract into your court in order to get someone to pay them what's written in the contract, this contract has already been paid. No different from Rava's wife saying, I know that woman that she can't take an oath. He says, I know about this star, this document. Amr lay Rav Papa. Uh, excuse me, Amr lay. So Rava responds to him. We're smack in the middle. Ika inish achamina vahade demar. Is there anybody who's with you who can also testify to this? Meaning there are two people there, but only Rav Papa says, I know that this contract was paid. So he asks, is there another witness? Because in a Jewish court, for that kind of thing, to say that a contract has been paid, you actually need two witnesses. Amr Leilo, Rav Papa says, no, I don't have two witnesses. Amr Leilo, so Rav says back to him, Af al gav ikamar even though you're here telling us that this contract has been paid, Eid Echad Lav Klumhu, having just one witness isn't good enough. So Amar Le Rav Adabar Matna, Rav Adabar Matna, who's standing there watching this whole thing, he says, wait a second, what's the difference? Velo Yehe Rav Papa Kibat Rav Chista? You don't think Rav Papa 
should be treated the same way as you treated your wife? Your wife told you something and you changed your judgment on the basis of it. How come when Rav Papa tells you something, you don't? In other words, how do you decide which relationships allow you to circumvent the regular standards? So the answer that, Rav, that the Gemara puts in Rav's mouth is Bat Rav Chista, the daughter of Rav Chista, Kimli Begava. I trust her. I know. I know. Relationships aren't just about affinity. They're about trust. I know that this person is trustworthy. My wife would never, ever, ever lie. Now, how does he know that? He's with her a lot. He spent his whole life with her. I know. But Mar, but Sir, meaning Rav Papa, Lo Kimli Bigave, I don't know that about him. Now that's wild. He's willing to trust his wife, and he's not willing to trust his colleague. So Amar Rav Papa, Rav Papa says, okay, Hashda the Amar Mar, now that you say Kimli Bigave, that it's enough to basically be able to say, I know this person doesn't lie that that's miltahi, that that counts, then guess what? Kigon Abba Mar, maybe when Abba Mar, who's Bri, who's my son, Zekim Libigave, who I totally trust implicitly, maybe if he tells me, then Karana Shtara Apume, then maybe I would tear up a contract if he told me he thought it was already paid. And then the Gemara pulls back and says, Karana Slakave, you're going to tear up a contract on the basis of something that someone you trust told you? Ella marana shtarap You know what? I would just impair it, meaning I would need further evidence in order to use people, uh, in order to get people to collect it. Now in this Gemara, Rava, who told us in the other Gemara, don't worry about your relationships. Don't make that the focal point because then you're not going to be able to go with the truth. Don't accept a bribe because your mind is going to be close to that person and you're not going to see what they've done, done wrong. It's that same Rava who here is essentially saying, you know what, because I know my wife, I have a relationship with her and her proximity to that other woman gives me new truth. What I'm going to tell you here is that sometimes relationships don't impair our ability to know something to learn something, to understand something, but the opposite, a relationship can give us the ability to see and to learn something that we didn't know. Proximity to someone is not just about blinding our eyes and making us believe everything they say, or in a case of animosity, blinding our eyes and not allowing us to hear anything they say, but actually, relationships can afford us the ability to expand our knowledge, to expand our understanding. And Rav Papa, I'm not sure if Rav Papa buys it, because either Rav Papa is playing and saying to Rava, well, guess what? If you can do that, then I can have my son decide what happens in my court. He's either saying to Rava, that's preposterous. How could you do that? Or he's saying, okay, well, then I guess we have a new standard and we have a new rule. So what we have here, I think, is something that we feel implicitly too. What happens when I actually meet people who have different experiences, who have different life knowledge than I do? I was actually having a conversation with somebody about this, and we were talking about um, people who are anti-vaccines. I don't have anybody who's anti-vaccines in my family that I know of, and I don't have any friends who are anti-vaccines. And I was talking about how I wonder what it would be like for somebody who does have someone in their family who's anti-vaccines. What does that relationship actually give them in terms of knowledge and understanding? And somebody who's in the conversation said, yeah, actually, I have someone in my family very close who's anti-vaccines. And she started talking about how she deeply disagrees. She thinks it's wrong. She thinks it's dangerous. And yet, what she realizes through the conversation with this person, with this family member, is that 
he's not crazy. He's not a kook. He's not the way people paint the other side to be. He's weighing things differently, and she deeply disagrees with the way he's weighing them, but he actually has values that he's working with. And as much as you may not agree, as much as you may be uncomfortable, there's something there. Or take the conversations about Israel or about race. What does it mean to actually be in proximity, to actually hear what somebody who's living on the Israeli side near the Gaza Strip has to say? What does it mean to hear from somebody who's living on the Gazan side? What does it mean to hear from somebody who's a person of color? What does it mean to hear from people who actually have different life experiences? How does that impact us? Is it something that's threatening, that it will interrupt our entire narrative? Is it something that can give us a slight tweak in the way we think of things? Or by the way, does it fall into the very same trap as the first Gemara that we looked at? The first Gemara, which told us, be careful. When you get close to people, you forget to interrogate what they say. When you get close to people, you're afraid to say something that may offend them. So what, what is going on with these two Gemaras? So I have a few ways of responding to this technically. One, we might say, you know what? The cases are really not the same. Rava would never allow a relationship with a litigant to impact his verdict, but his wife is not a litigant. She doesn't have a stake in this in the same kind of way. Now, of course, I'm going to play devil's advocate and say, how do we know, right? Rav Chista knows, Rav Chista trusts, but how do we know? Another possibility, maybe this kind of objectivity is impossible. And maybe Rava is giving us an example of somebody who actually fell into the trap. And Rav Papa is pointing that out to him. How could you fall into this trap? Just because your wife told you this doesn't mean, and you trust her, of course you trust her, but don't fall into that trap. Maybe this is not actually standing against that other Gemara, but it's Rav Papa standing up for that other Gemara and saying, just like they can't be a litigant, they can't be an informant either. There's something actually deeply flawed. But I really like, and of course you could say it's also, it's, it's just his wife, but he doesn't even trust Rav Papa. But that to me is like a technical answer. There are very few people whose relationships you would trust, you know, the relationship you would trust implicitly. But there's, there's another read of this that to me is very deep, which is what we need from our relationships is we need trust and we need integrity. And the people who gain our trust have to be people who show integrity. And the way to show integrity is to show that it's not just about teams and it's not just about pushing agendas. It's actually about having a deep conversation. And I wonder if the same Rava who said in the other Gemara, I adjudicate the way that I adjudicate, come hell or high water, some people are gonna like me, some people are not gonna like me, but my integrity is what matters. And honestly, there are people who maybe will like me because of my integrity. Maybe those are the only people who Rava trusts. Maybe Rava's wife is somebody who he has seen through thick and thin, doesn't lie, hasn't lied, whether to her gain, whether to her loss. And we don't know, but clearly there was something for Rava about his spouse that was deeper than his colleague, Rav Papa, because he wasn't willing to believe what Rav Papa said, but he was willing to believe what his spouse said. So what does it take to be people who deserve other people's trust? What does it take to be people who we are actually gonna trust? I think our standards need to be higher for that. I wanna pause and take questions or comments. Justice, do we have some questions or comments from the chat? We have more than a few, so I'll give you uh, Great. a few to start. We have, we, you should just know that I see the number of Q&A. The number is 47. Are we gonna get to 47? I doubt it, but as I promised, I am actually here to open a can of worms. I'm not here to solve anything. I'm here to open a can of worms. So I think the can's been opened. Yeah, Justice. 
Okay, so there's a set of questions asking um, about Rava's wife's, uh, the information she shared. Was it, 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 does it fall into the category of Lashon Hara? Is it gossip? And so what does that mean about it? And related to that, um, someone asks that you, you could trust her, or Rava could trust her, but that doesn't mean that what she knows or what she heard is itself factual or, or true, that there's a difference there, that those could be separated out. Um, second, uh, Rabbi Ali Jacobson framed the tension between building trust through relationships and building trust through expertise and wondering how does that play out um, in, in the court? This is, you know, a Mobius strip where it just, it has no beginning, it has no end. This is a Mobius strip. Relationships and truth are a Mobius strip because expertise it was actually a great article. Uh, who was it? Stanley Fish, I think. Stanley Fish wrote a great, great article. And if you email me, I'll send it to you, really. Alana.steinhain at shellenhartman.org. Stanley Fish wrote a great article where he talks about what it means to live in a postmodern era. He says, wait a minute. So we live in a postmodern era, so there's no truth, right? And he says, no, 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 no. Not at all. What happens is the standards, there are standards for what makes something true. And those standards are developed in various disciplines among experts. And every so often, those standards do change. So there are narratives, histories, stories that have been told scientifically, politically, religiously, socially, on the basis of certain standards for what makes something true. And then 50 years later, we start to realize, oh, you know what? We were actually only looking at this. You know, there were reasons why we were only looking at this narrow and that now our horizons are expanding. And he said that is actually something that people use and capitalize on to say, oh, you see, there's no truth. Because 50 years ago, the story was different, and now 50 years. And what he suggests is that there has to be, there have to be agreed upon standards for what is true within a certain discipline or arena, even if those standards will change. So when the great question was asked of, so Rava trusts his wife implicitly, but what were the standards? Is she an expert in the information that she gave? Or is it just something that she knows? And how much do you interrogate that? I think that is a critical question because what Rava is assuming is that she both knows what she's talking about and is telling him the truth. So both are there. There's an assumed, it's hard to say expertise because it's not an abstract knowledge set here, but there's an expertise that he's assuming that she has. And in general, the idea of expertise, and it's difficult in a, in a Jewish Beitin kind of context, in a Jewish court kind of context, the definition of expertise sometimes is also like, wait a second, you weren't even there. How could you possibly say that X, you know, X, Y, Z happened? So in some ways, I love for these Gemaras to go together because when you look at a person giving you info because you're proximate to them, you also have to ask, like, what are the standards of that information? Like, what makes you know that that information is true? And how am I, I know how you feel, right? Going back to the anti-vaxxers um, conversation. I know how you feel, but does that mean that I think that your standards of truth are right? And I'm supposed to take that, right? I think that's a really excellent way of um, starting to peel away at the layers of what proximity and relationship, relationship mean. Where are the places where we scrutinize with standards? And where are the places where we just say, okay, I believe you. And where are the places where we say, I believe that you feel that way and that you interpret the data that way but I don't think that rises to the standards that I actually think. So I love that question. The second, um, 
And and I think I combined the first and the second. Robert, should you take the next round? Okay, here are two more. Uh, the first one is a comment from Daniel Spiro, who says that this discussion seems to lead us in a direction where, at least in the court, we can't really practice by strict rules so much that instead we have to think of them as guidelines and maybe think of everything as a case by case basis. So if that's true, how, how would that play out with the kind of relation, the, the, um, the relational work that you're trying to make these examples apply to? Second, uh, this is from Clara Silver, who, who says that two very truthful people could have different experiences of the exact same event and report in their experience. She gave an example of, you know, the version that a police officer experiences and the version that the person that the police officer is working with experiences. And so there seems to be a tension between evidence versus testimony. Um, Jackie Bailey also kind of brought this in of evidence versus relationships. So how did that, how does that play out in these Gamora? Oh my goodness. It's, it, this is, I think, exactly, um, I think this is exactly what's complicated, right? And this is why I brought up the Stanley Fish, because I think we need to have actual standards of what is true and evidence. There, there, ha there actually have to be agreed upon standards of what is true. And I also think that we can find, even with those standards, that there are times when people see something differently. But if you start with some sort of vocabulary that is the same, right? So in Jewish law, it, it's basically having two witnesses who come and say something, you know, in a court of law. What is it in our, you know, what is it in our social and political and religious circles that, like, what are the standards that mean that something is actually true and something actually happened? And I think because we're moving so, so quickly, and especially now because we're all online, we're moving so quickly, we read a headline or we read um, a, a, um, like a suggestion that somebody may be thinking of doing something and suddenly it happens and it's true, right? I think part of the question, I don't know that we're gonna be able to develop standards but we at least, that, that we can all hold to, but we at least need to have some standards for ourselves where we can say, I believe this is true because of X, Y, X, Y, and Z. And if somebody says to you, well, I believe this is true because of A, B, and C, we need to figure out, like, are these feelings? Are these things that you actually perceived? Are they provable? Are they not provable? how much information do you have, right? So let's take the example. I'm going to take an example from the United States um, that's going to get me into trouble because those are always interesting examples, I think, because sort of like, oh, what's going to happen? So there's, uh, or, or actually I'll do it abstract and then maybe I'll, I'll use it. Let's say you see a photo, right? You see a photo of two people who look a certain way doing a certain activity that you assume is, well, yeah, those people, of course those people are doing that, right? And then you find out that like you saw a cropped version of the photo and actually the zoom out is that there were a lot of people, some people who look like them, some people who don't look like them, right? That kind of thing, it's very, very simple, right? Or how about when we make decisions, right, on, on things when we actually don't know the facts? I was having a conversation with somebody the other day about um, you know this whole monument thing that's happening in America. Canadians, help us. Um, there's a whole monument issue that's happening in America. And somebody was saying to me, well, what's wrong with Thomas Jefferson? So I said, I'm not, I'm not saying whether any monuments should be taken down or put up or what should happen there, but it is really important that you know your history in terms of slaveholding of the founders of the United States of America if you're gonna engage in the conversation, right? So. Part of, this, part of this is actually the question of how much are people interrogating and thinking for themselves and learning and growing, and how much has it become a party line, which I think is what makes it even difficult to have a conversation because everything has to be a presumptive truth. Like, of course we think this, of course you don't think that, of course, right? So there's, 
you know, uh, I, but I really, I like, I like the question. And I, I do think that you can have, you can have your, um, one can have their opinions about things lined up in a way that, you know, there's, there's synergy between my thoughts about whether it should be big government or small government, or whether Israel should annex or Israel shouldn't annex, and some other thoughts in my life. I can, I can become like more of a liberal or more of a conservative. That can be generally, I'm allowed to, I, I don't, I think I'm allowed to swim in those waters, right? I'm allowed to decide this is my general identity. But what's, what's difficult from my perspective is that that general identity, which has a mesh of both ideology and relationship, is becoming less and less about the actual underpinnings of the ideology and more and more about what team I'm supposed to be on. And I find that very dangerous. Um, and that's really what I'm trying to push against. And I don't think it's sufficient to say, well, you know what, we're not judges. But I will say that if you continued learning that Gemara on Ketubot Kufhe 105, what you would see is that the Gemara continues and starts to ask questions like, well, what does relationship mean? If somebody helps you on your way to the course at courthouse and it turns out they're the litigant, are you allowed to judge them or not, right? And it actually ends in such a, um, a heart-wrenching way. It ends with a rabbi sitting inside a box, literally sitting inside a box, a rabbi who is a judge, kind of like crying and feeling guilty that he might have done something through his relationship that impacted somebody else's adjudication that perverted it in some little way. And so in some ways, these Gemaras, they're not telling us, okay, we're gonna fix this for you, but they are telling us how difficult this interconnectedness is that it provides opportunities and it also can give us blind spots, right? Let's say justice, can we take a, a couple more and then we're gonna close up? If we have a couple more of our 57. Yeah. Okay, so the next one is noticing sort of the role the judge is playing in society here of, of trying to be on the balcony, holding this view um, in light of, you know, your comment just now about how we're, we're all seem to be on our teams. No one seems to be trying to act like a judge of having that neutral perspective of wanting to hear. So how do, do you have, do you have thoughts about like how to, how to take that ideology of the judge, at least that perspective the judge is going for and yeah. apply it to this team-based game that we uh, seem to be playing? Um, and yeah, so let's let uh, let me see what else comes in, and uh, maybe do one yeah, more. Yeah, we can end with this. I think we can end with this. I think that is a really important question. How do we develop the ideology of the judge? And it's funny because we're also judgmental. Not you guys, just me. We're also <laughs> judgmental, and it's like we're always the judges, right? But actually, the ideology of the judge, that idea of getting up on the balcony of not just being on the dance floor and doing your steps, but actually being able to see it all, I think it requires a split screen. And I think the split screen can help us tremendously. There is a part of the screen that is about your advocacy. It's about where you raise your voice and what you say and what you, who you vote for and what your petitions are and, and what you're signing, all that. There's another part of the screen that is about education that is about knowledge, that is about growth. And that is, that's missing. We are only in the advocacy side of the screen right now. We are not in the side of the screen that is actually about learning and growing and deepening. We're judging based on who do we feel close to? Who do we worry about thinking badly about us? Who do we trust? Right? And I would argue that one of the ways to actually be able to develop this judge like orientation where you're on the balcony is to make yourself a space where you are able to have a conversation about this, where it's not about who wins and who loses, but it's actually about information. To be able to set the ground rules 
somewhere, even if it's small, even if it's with three people or it's with your whole congregation, it, somewhere where the ground rules are, this is not a place where we're going to resolve this issue. This is a place where we're going to delve deeply and learn about this issue and learn about this issue. And that muscle, once we practice that muscle over and over again, the people who participate in that become used to that being something that they can do even as they're going to go to rallies and they're going to go to marches and they're going to vote and they're going to, these are not contradictory, but they are different disciplines. And those different disciplines need to exist side by side if we're going to maintain relationships and if we're going to maintain our sense of growth in understanding the world around us. So I want to conclude with just a few questions to leave us with, okay? My questions to leave us with, and I really do hope that this opens a conversation rather than closes it, one is, what are our blind spots? We know that bribery comes in many forms. Who do we think we owe? And how does that impact what our blind spots are? That's one. Two, are we able to recognize when someone we think is often wrong does something or says something that's right? Are we able to recognize when someone who we often think is right does something or says something wrong? Are we able to do this when it's not we ourselves who notice it, but when it's someone else who points it out to us? Three, do we love people who say what we want to hear? Or do we love people who are not pandering and have integrity? Do we hate people who say what we don't want to hear? The last one, who do we trust and why? I hope that this exploration has been an opportunity to in fact get on the balcony about this question and then to be able to go back and have a sense of self-reflectiveness and reflectiveness about what we see on the dance floor so that we can keep growing as a Jewish community and as a Jewish people and so that we can keep growing as individuals because Anything else means that this pandemic will have taught us very, very little. So I hope that you'll take this important step with me of being able to start thinking about this and talking to people about it, and maybe even learning these sources with people you love so that it's not just about the actual issues that are dividing you, but it's about the wisdom, it's about the Torah, it's about the ideas that are offered to us to use as a way of navigating the world. I see that Justice is asking everybody to stay for a brief survey. I'm gonna go off my camera and just say thank you all so much for joining and we look forward to continuing to learn with you this summer. Stay well, stay safe, bye.